are we are we live refresh linkedin yeah we are live yeah it looks like we're live yay all right we did it we did it well hello everyone and welcome to our first ask me anything uh just a quick recap uh i'm helen McHugh, an experience in recruiter enablement strategist uh, and Adam and I are teaming up on a monthly Ask Me Anything series. We're bringing in awesome experts across the industry to talk about their philosophies, their best practices, just programs they've led all around the topic of recruiter enablement. Um, Adam, take it to you. Yeah, okay. Um, great. Thank you for um, introducing yourself. And uh, Holland and I started talking about recruiter enablement um probably about a year ago but one of the things that was quite funny was i'd bought a website which was recruiterenablement.org to talk all about recruiter enablement because recruiterenablement.com wasn't um available and uh while we were talking uh, doing a recording together all and said oh yeah that's because i own it by the way <laughs> <laughs> we went down the same path um we so sure do you want to do a quick quick intro sophie's looking out sophie's keeping us straight making sure that we're doing the right things and is uh going to be in the in the chat uh making sure that we don't miss any important questions sophie do you want to do a quick intro yes absolutely so hi folks i'm sophie power um former talent acquisition in in early stage startups so know well the need for for good enablement to uh, get stuff done and also a community manager um, for uh, the recruiter enablement LinkedIn group and also TTC. Um, so hello. Yes, I'll be keeping an eye on comments. So if you have any questions, keep them coming in and uh, I will be bringing them into the chat. Wonderful. OK, Nick, um, you're our guest of honor in our inaugural Ask Me Anything session. Give us a quick introduction to you and your background. I mean, no pressure, right? No pressure. I suppose the good thing is this is going to be the best and worst, however we do it, if it's the first. So I've got, I'm, I'm good on that side. Um, so I'm Nick Thompson and I uh, lead our global TA Center of Excellence um, at Halion. I've been there nearly eight months now. Um, and I, I, I just love this space. Like it, it's not about what I create in an ivory tower in my own little castle. It's about how do the, the masses, how do the volumes actually make it come live, make it come to reality. So, yeah, I was like, having worked with you, Adam, in the past and Holland, having worked closely with you as well, I'm like, hell yes, I've got to do this and I want to do this. And I think it's something we're not taking seriously enough within TA. There's just this assumption everyone can do it. And I don't know that's always right. And I don't think anyone in TA has any malice. I just don't think they always have the platforms and the knowledge and the way, the places to get the knowledge. So as always, I'm hoping to try and make TA a little bit better than it was 30 minutes before we had this call. <laughs> Give I us your that. definition. Like, t tell tell it what what's it what's recruiter enablement all about to you? It's part of what you do. It's not the whole thing, of course. It's a part no, of what you're responsible yeah. for. But what what is that specific thing? I mean, the reality of it is, it's the proof point of everything that I do. Whether it's here, whether it was in previous roles as talent marketing and other areas, if recruiters aren't doing it, it isn't happening. Like that's the crux of it. I can lift it, I can automate it, I can move it to offshore teams, different teams. Reality is if you want it done at scale, we've all got to do it within TA and everyone's got to share that role. So for me, it's, I, I describe my role of, I don't, I don't do it. I help our recruiters do it better, more efficiently, more effectively, and just help them be better at their jobs. Mm -hmm. And, that can be strategy, that can be ways of learning, that can be through constant reminders, it can be through nagging, it can be the carrot, it can be the stick, it can be a mix of approaches, but ultimately it's to help our recruiters recruit better. I love that. The simple, the simple definition. 
Um, and I also love like it because I do think Recruit Enablement is this huge umbrella. Um, Adam and I both have a philosophy that Recruiter Enablement is that umbrella. And then there's some tenants underneath, uh, marketing being a huge one. And no, um, Nick, you and I met when you were at IBM. I was at Red Hat, both leading talent attraction and marketing teams. And now you've shifted into this global head, this bigger, broader TA center of excellence role. And so would also love to know, you know, how's your perspective on recruiter enablement shifted? Um, you know, as you moved into this broader scope, maybe less marketing centric and more leaned into some of those elements that you've talked about around strategy and learning. Give us a little perspective on how your thought or um, perspective has evolved as you've shifted into new roles. Yeah, it's a really interesting one because I, I don't know that it shifted much, to hmm. be honest. I think marketing is the delivery of what we're doing. I, I don't I don't want to boil candidate experience or, or, or recruiter enablement to candidate experience, but it kind of is. If we get recruiter enablement wrong, if our recruiters aren't able to do their role, that doesn't just get someone from A to B that gives an experience, positive, realistic of the brand, however it needs to be, it hasn't really changed i'm just now not talking so much about social media and these other bits and pieces i'm like make your interactions matter make them real mm -hmm. we the market the economy has changed mm -hmm. a few years ago you had no applications you had to go and get everybody in today's world you're getting a lot more applications they're not necessarily right but they all know someone else and there is an experience piece and there's a catalyst piece of get it right now. Mm -hmm. And you could, should be riding a wave of success in a difficult market when it switches back in, I hope, very, very quickly, because then it means the economy's boomed back in a very great way. But this is an investment piece. And for me, whilst I've held attraction roles and employ brand recruitment marketing roles, I've always been involved in processes, in how to do things, in platforms, in ways of working. And it's, I don't think you can be a good attraction leader without understanding and that experience is the proof point of that marketing campaign almost. Yes. Amen. <laughs> awesome. So, um, you know, I know that, and we'll switch it to the audience in just a sec. We know, you know, that's who's here. That's who's come to see you and ask you questions. But uh, let's talk a little bit about like just kind of tech underpinning RE. You know, I think that, you know, Adam with Poetry, some other, you know, players out there on the market, technology has really, I think, grown leaps and bounds in terms of making our lives as enablers easier to really equip our recruiters who are sifting through those mass applications who are doing that direct outreach day in, day out. So talk to me a little bit about tech and how you think about technology and the role it plays underpinning recruiter enablement. Um, so Adam, I'm not going to break your dreams and be really horrible here, but I am going to say I do think technology is an enabler. It is not the only and every solution to what we do. And I've spoken to nowhere near as many people as you folks. I'm not even going to claim that. But the one thing I hear consistently is, but we expect our recruiters to know this. We expect them to bring this knowledge. They've, they've been around the block. They've worked for Meta. They've worked here. They know how to do it. Where were they ever shown? Where have they ever been shown? And I think the technology makes this consistent. It removes it from... How does Holland deliver it versus how does Nick deliver it? It makes it consistent. It means should Holland or Nick win the lottery, always look on the positive side, then we disappear. This enablement still happens tomorrow. It still carries on. So I think the tech is the enabler. Mm -hmm. But are you allowing a culture of development, of continuous learning? Are you allowing recruiters breathing space to get better? Mm -hmm. Or are you saying they're rubbish because you've never invested in them, you've never taught them, you've never given them space to learn, and then just hire and fire every two minutes because it's a boom market. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, just, I hate that. Like, it's just so wrong to me in millions of ways. 
I love that. Yeah. When, uh, when I was at Red Hat, we were working through our annual strategy as everyone does, you know, end of the year, looking at what are the goals rolling down from the top and really thinking through like, what were we going to deliver in TA? And we took a step back and we had, you know, the obvious buckets, talent attraction, technology optimization. We were going through an ATS, you know, rollout at the time, you know, enhancing processes along the way and about, you know, a, a good like 16 hours into this leadership offsite, we took a step back and said, huh, we should probably, to exact your point, Nick, like give our recruiters some learning um, yep. space. And so we actually built in a whole acumen pillar um, as part of that strategy that really, you know, thought through what is the 10 to 20 percent of time that we want to give recruiters back to learn, to evolve, to really hone their craft. Um, I do think because it's, you know, a lot of times it's feast or famine in recruiting. You're going through these crazy peaks and valleys of can't hire quick enough to a massive lull, but making sure that you're carving out that consistent time to hone your craft and really, um, you know, dig into technology at your fingertips, content, just things that are going on in the business and really honing in that business acumen is is huge. So I, I love that perspective. Um, Adam, anything from you before we toss it to the audience? I think we can sit yeah. here and chat with Nick all day, um, but I want to make sure that we give folks, you know, the opportunity to ask Nick some questions too. Yeah, no, absolutely. Just one, just one last one for me. Um, I believe that pretty much everything is marketing. Mm -hmm. um, like from the, the way that somebody gets assessed to the way that they receive feedback to their first impression when they walk into reception in the, you know, um, in, in the office or whatever. Um, recruiter enablement is not, is not all about marketing. It is about knowledge and it's about, mm -hmm. I use this acronym MOLT, M-O-L-T, Marketing, Operations, Learning and Tools. That's the, that's the four things that I, that I use as, as sort of subcategories. Um, however, I do believe that, uh, recruitment is more of a marketing led job than it ever has been because of the way that consumers, um, you know, consume everything that they consume today. So, uh, what are the different like assets? If I'm a recruiter in your organization, what are the different assets, marketing assets that I need to be able to do my job properly? And what, what, what does your team like enable me with? Um, so I, I think back to my very early days agency recruiter and i mean this is aging me now very significantly but we had the the rebuttal books mm -hmm. and we had the i'm not looking price too much i don't need support i don't need this as a minimum just answer those consistently now don't script them don't you have to answer it word for word but i'm pretty sure in 30 seconds we could probably list off the top five reasons or top five concerns that a candidate has that are interchangeable to company. They do not matter what color your logo. We could answer those right here, right now. And then probably a minute later, we could create a line around each one of those. So if we're saying in under five and a half minutes, we could answer probably 90% of our candidate questions. Why aren't we? And I, I'm not just saying us. I mean, the industry yep. and as individuals, why aren't we? Yep. I think it starts there. And my approach with everything has always been solve for the 99% and then start worrying about the 1%. Mm -hmm. Whereas most people seem to approach the, but what about the left-handed Capricorn rocket scientist that's <laughs> applying for a job in India? Screw them. They're 1%. They don't matter. You're not going to get there. So start with the basics i think the rebuttal books the talking points the how to answer them write them down to start with then once you've written them down and people are using them and they say to you like my in mail response rate has gone up i'm closing more candidates i'm getting more diverse talent create an image create a video create a blog create a whatever the hell you want to create for it make it fancier but just <laughs> minimal viable product and iterate on it and then get them to use it yeah i've also found adam and i know we've spoken on this the fancier you make a video just the bigger barrier to entry it seems to make things for recruiters to use because it's like 
oh, this is too much. This isn't just a throwaway item now. This is like, mm -hmm. it needs an introduction and it needs an email on its own. Whereas a few sentences that people can copy and paste, it's disposable content, it's throwaway. They can chuck it in left, right and center. So I think I'd love it if we worked in a world of personalized, specific videos of our CEOs talking to everybody. Just write it down and just get people at least saying the same lines mm -hmm. in a similar way. Um, and then worry about what comes next. Mm -hmm. Like, are people not accepting an offer? What are they asking? Why are they saying no? What are the problems? But I think as well as our team creating it and creating the answers, I need to know what they are because I'm not on the phones to candidates. I'm not on emails to candidates. I don't talk to them that often. Mm -hmm. So I need that input from TA and from my counterparts to go, Nick, no one cares about your X policy. Everyone wants to know this answer. Mm -hmm. It hurts because mm -hmm. I want to share the fancy video on X policy, but no one cares on that. They want to know what's your hybrid at Halion working policy look like or what's this look like? Just got to be consistent with those and start simple. Mm -hmm. So I think you're talking about, um, uh, I, I wrote a blog about this earlier today. I think if this is the same subject we're talking about, which which I've described as crib sheets or yeah, like exactly that. Know, yeah. clock track, that type yeah. of thing. So talking points, yeah. you know, you want to, you want to give people the talking points and you want to give them the best responses to objections. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming that one of the ones at Halion has been a lot of people in, if I'm working in Coca-Cola or I've been working in Unilever or something like that, I, I mean, they're the people that probably you're looking to hire and mm -hmm. Halion's a, a, a new brand, maybe not now, but like 18 months ago, it was probably, what the hell's Halion? Yep. Uh, yeah, and, and to be honest, Adam, that's been everywhere I've ever worked. Like, if I look at Vodafone, who the hell are Vodafone? They're a retail shop. No, they're not. They're a data company. If I look at IBM, you make keyboards. We did 7,000 years ago. We now no longer make them. So, honestly, this is the only time that I've actually gone, do you know what? Yeah, fair. We didn't exist two years ago. So, yes, you may be wondering that. But let me tell you this. I would say most of our candidates, wherever we work, whoever we work for, don't know who our business really is. At Do best, you know, they might know the consumer side, but they don't know what our business really is. Just just, just uh, completely random as an aside. Um, for the first time this morning, um, I went to brush my teeth and saw on my Aquafresh, Halion. And I went, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we're there. We're creeping out. You're going to see us a lot more. So, yeah, there's a lot more of who we are and what we're about. But it, I think consumer brands, it can be easier because people mm -hmm. see your products and understands what that is. Mm -hmm. But do does a data scientist understand why a brand that makes toothpaste hire data scientists? Yeah. Probably not. We're probably not an obvious place for them to come to yeah. we're a really cool place for them to come to and we are hiring data scientists if anyone does know any that are looking but it is about telling the stories to people and again if our recruiters are saying our email response rates suck no one's coming back to us they're not opening them every candidate says no then that's something we need to enable them on it isn't all content it isn't all fancy it's a what you say you over there, Adam, you've got a 50% response rate to Nick's 20%. Adam, what are you doing that Nick isn't? Because Nick should be doing whatever it is you're doing. Yeah. And I think so much of recruiter enablement is about a community. It's about, it's not about ivory tower dictation at all. It is about Adam, you're winning. Nick is not winning. How do we share what Adam's doing to get Nick winning? Yes, it's bubble up the best. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we can think about it in terms of con candidates. Sorry, Sophie, I'll get, come back to you in one second. In terms of in terms of candidates, like we can think about it in the context of which which are the job what, which are the job areas where mm -hmm. they are almost certainly in your industry, and yeah. therefore they're more likely to know your brand and their objections and their perception is going to be different. Whereas 
if I'm a financial accountant, I could be working in any industry and Halion doesn't, yeah. So the, the message will definitely be different for people that are in industry or mm -hmm. people that are profession, but industry, you know, agnostic. Yeah, and Sophie, we've taken a sorry. bit of approach of like, and this is the only time I'll ever say be like a politician, because don't ever be like a politician. But this is the only time I would say it. It's like, but politicians do have their talking points nailed. When you ask them something, they tell you their three token answers that they've got planned. So like, Adam, this is why you should work for us. Boom, 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 boom. You might not have asked that, but I'm going to tell you that because you need to know that. Everyone else I've ever spoken to, that's what they've said. That's what they've asked. That's what they wanted to know. So I'm going to get ahead of you mm -hmm. asking me the question. I'm going to give you that info. Yes. Straight away as a recruiter, I'm more credible because I read your mind. Mm -hmm. I didn't read your mind. The other thousand people I spoke to that month all asked me the same question, but they asked it second. I've just answered some of those points for you. So it is a numbers game. Like it's keep it super, super simple. And it is a numbers game. Nice. I think what's really interesting is one of the first questions I got, which is uh, from a, a conversation I had uh, before the session. So um, hopefully they're watching now was I've got a really small team. Um, I work for a really tiny company. Like I can't just, get recruiter enable I could get a recruiter enablement team how does it work if, if you're in a small business and actually a lot of what you've just said Nick is it answers that question really neatly actually without me having to ask it which is awesome um because it is about you know kind of keeping it simple um how can we replicate things um you know what can we do to sort of distill ideas and, and communicate them and share those ideas out and you don't need a big team um mm -hmm. to be able to do that um you know you can create you know um uh, Mike Clements in the comments has just put playbooks, uh, very succinct, simple comments. So thank you for that, Mike. And yeah, just playbooks. And and that doesn't just have to go to your recruitment team either. That can go to your hiring managers um, so that they can, you know, sort of reel these off in, in interviews. And it adds extra, adds extra kind of credibility and weight to, to what you're saying to candidates. And it keeps the messaging consistent throughout the journey as well. So yeah, it's a really interesting point, Nick. Thank you. Yeah, it's just, it's seriously simple. Like everyone would love a team, of course they would. But then where do you stop having a team when TA's 20,000 people long doing it? It's like, it doesn't work. Like, just talk. Like, yeah. Sophie, you're hiring here, you're winning. Nick's hiring the other side of the desk and he's not winning as much. What are you doing, Sophie? It really is an environment and a culture versus a technology or team play. It's like, the technology won't work if you're not having those conversations mm -hmm. and the team won't work if no one's asking those questions. So there is a bit of a take some personal accountability and responsibility. And if someone is absolutely smashing it, ask them how, ask them why. Mm -hmm. Might be a different market, might be a different candidate audience. Just ask them. Yeah. Like, there's very few idiots in TA that won't tell you. <laughs> And if there is, well, then you're out of luck. You found one of the 1%. But most people will tell you how they're doing it. And just try. Mm -hmm. Nice. And uh, Daniela agrees with you, by the way, in the comments. She just oh, says, good. 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 Point. Um, so thank, thank you, you Daniela. <laughs> you know, I, I think that actually it's a really important point that you just brought up there, Sophie, because so many teams have gone from 10 people in recruiting to five people in recruiting over the last year, right? They're not going to get back to 10 people. They're, they're not going to get back to 10 people. They might get back to seven people, um, but that team's going to have to do what 10 were doing 18 months ago. So every time you send out a message to 40 candidates to go and find out if they're interested in talking to you about the opportunity, just make, you, make sure you've stored that somewhere mm -hmm. so you can go back to it and then, like, track the success. Was it, did it work? Did I get more than five responses or whatever? Track the number of responses. And then stop reinventing the wheel because that's going to save you a lot of time. Yeah. Reinventing yeah. the wheels, yeah. you know, takes up a lot of time. I know that's yeah. something, Holland, that you've uh, done, done a lot of around, like, give people, like, the scripts and templates and things that can be reutilized. Yeah, and just create the space. Like Nick said, keep it simple. Uh, so if you don't know if that person was a recruiting leader or like a recruiter themselves, but here nor there, 
make sure 15 minutes, like spend 15 minutes, like in your standups, whatever like form you're having, like you don't have to have a recruiter named like headcount or team. You just need 15 minutes of space to have those conversations of, Hey, I was working this hard search this week. I sent out this message. It got this 60% amazing response rate. Where's the shared folder that we drop that in and how does everybody access it? Or to Nick's earlier comments, like I used to do objects and handling and like mining for my team. Like let's spend five minutes on each of these three questions that's come in, document these like in the moment on the fly. It doesn't have to be this arduous, like burdensome process or project or program later. It's as quick as 15 minutes, collect the goods, put them in a shared space and use it, iterate on it, massage it, all that good stuff. Definitely. And um, Myla in the, the comments agrees, as you uh, sort of commented a couple of minutes ago, just saying knowledge sharing is really important, educating managers and having a consistent process and fair selection. Um, and, and the knowledge sharing piece is really important to doing that. Um, she's gone on to, to add, um, we see larger organisations looking at costs and overheads. And this is where uh, providers have a, a massive need to, to bridge this gap um, as it becomes a, a cost from a different pot as well. And we've had uh as well um thank you for for your comments my i agree um you know sort of getting that that consistency um and yeah just having keeping it really simple is is so important i think um and then can we just can we just dwell on that for a second yeah, yeah. Second. Put that down <laughs> yeah this is there's a there's a lot there's a lot to dive into on that one yeah. so i want to talk about hiring managers in particular so yeah. like nick when you think about enabling hiring managers mm -hmm. are there any nuances to that or is it the same way that you enable recruiters or is it enabling recruiters to enable managers or mm -hmm. like how do you think about all this yeah there's a couple of different approaches like typically i'd normally take a train the train the type approach of like mm -hmm. my team is not big enough there's not enough of us to train all the managers because typically most recruiter has multiple managers and it's hard enough to get around your recruiters, let alone then suddenly start going elsewhere. So previously, we've created uh, not a Halion, but at other organizations, uh, license to hire, where mm -hmm. managers had to undertake training before they can raise requisitions. Mm -hmm. Super unpopular to start with. And then everybody loved it. So it's one of those of, depending on your org, it may or may not be the right thing to do. Um, but with any enablement, it's what's in it for them. Like that's the question that you need to be looking at at this. Not just this is the process I need Adam to follow. Mm -hmm. Great. You might listen, you might look, you might do a little bit of it, but you're probably going great. Another mandated learning that I'm then going to just sack off in a week's time when no one's watching and do my own thing. Whereas if I would say to you, Adam, you will free up more of your time, you will hit more of your targets, mm -hmm. you will find your job easier and more satisfactory to do. There's a different vibe of wanting to do this then. It's not another Nick training course I've got to do before he beats me up to hang on. If this really does make my job easier and better mm -hmm. and more enjoyable, I don't hate myself that much that I don't want those items. So you start changing it. And for a manager, it is a slightly different view. It's very similar. They still want to hire. They still want to be quicker. But they want to get someone that's right and will stay and will stay at that business. Mm -hmm. So it's not massively different. But again, it's what's in it for me. Mm -hmm. I think it's any learning approach, right? Yeah. I think there's the what's in it for me, but there's also a lot of hiring managers like hire one to two times per year. And so there's also that, hey, they just need a refresh. They need a reminder. They've been out of the hiring game for quite some time. Um, when I was at Delta, we even like super some, I love like license to hire, you know, as a marketer, like love like the catchy course. We, we didn't go like the full like mandate route. But as simple as like when you submitted a requisition to the ATS, my team had programmed an automatic email that came to you and it took you to an enablement hub for hiring managers. And it had, hey, it's been a while. Maybe you hire all the time. Maybe it's been a while. But 
here are like the five things that you need to know about the process today. And then here are some stats and like why that matters. And so yeah. for corporate type roles, we gave them a LinkedIn leader's guide to LinkedIn with some stats on, hey, if we tap into your network, we're going to get this rec filled this much more quickly. Um, you know, here are some new objections that have come online as the company has evolved from X brand to Y brand. Here's some information around our financials that candidates are probably going to ask you. So a lot of hiring managers, there's that what's in it for them, but they also like hiring can be very taxing. They have day jobs, you know, they have this vacancy on their team. So things are not running efficiently. They want that help. They want that support and packaging up and making them part of the experiences you're going to win not only like credibility with your customer, but also make the process go a lot faster for them, which is great. I, I agree with all that. I think that one, one other, um, I, I think like, I can't remember if it was you, Nick, that said, or maybe it was you, Holland. I can't remember. Somebody said about like, and I can't remember if it was I, people like training or they don't like training. I think there's a difference between certain types of training, right? When you're doing your infosec training and you have to then fill in that form at the end which mm -hmm. it proves that you've watched the video and you understand it yeah i would say that feels to me like a tick box exercise whereas yeah. if i am a hiring manager hiring more than one or two a year i'm hiring 30 people a year and the success of those people is going to make the difference between me getting a pay rise and hitting my targets and getting promoted or not like I think I, if I was a TA COE person or an enablement person, I think I could probably do a pretty good job of making sure that those hiring managers understood that what's in it for them is very significant on the individual yep. level. Yep, exactly that. And uh, Holland, to your point of, um, like we tap into your network, you, your kind of point of using LinkedIn and using them as ambassadors. Now let's just rephrase that exact same thing of like, Manager, we need you to do this because it will reduce our cost per hire within TA. Yes. Mm -hmm. no, I, I'm out. I don't care. Like, that's your problem. That's not my problem. Yes. It's the same. It's another solution mm -hmm. from the same action. Mm -hmm. And I think we do just wear TA hat far too often. So it is a what's in it for them, as you say. And mm -hmm. it's the same thing for recruiters your cost per hire will be reduced, it will be faster, all of these bits and pieces. For the manager, you put yourself forward out there as a bigger talent, all of these bits and pieces, so many goals, but it's just, it's a translation piece, mostly. Mm -hmm. I've been able to translate it to those different personas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But also so keep learning small. Mm -hmm. Like I've seen people do two-day workshops face to face was pre-covid i'm not gonna lie come on we're all over that like no one wants to do that anymore it is about micro learning and mm. we haven't done it yet not saying we've got it right we've got a lot more ahead of us but we are looking at things like when the manager gets an interview invite that they just get a little micro bit of learning about that interview like how to prep what to do how to take notes here's some questions to answer like mm. don't don't wait for them to go and find it. Push it to them at the right and appropriate moments. Mm -hmm. And they'll click it like crazy. I've also seen some really nice stuff where they've actually used that learning that the recruiter gets and the manager gets and actually shared it with a candidate ahead of an interview yes. so that they have an expectation of what mm -hmm. the manager will be working with them. And again, mm -hmm. It's just another level of social contracts, mm. adherence, peer pressure. Like, I think it's a great way of doing it. And it just yeah. shows complete transparency. Mm -hmm. and seriously, uh, I think if you sent it to your candidate and asked them how many other interviews have they been for and how many other companies helped them ace their interview, mm. the answer will be a big fat zero. So mm. it's not expensive but it's sure as hell going to make you stand out for positive reasons mm -hmm. with very little extra effort. Yeah. I'll give a quick little plug for a tool on that same um, topic. This is another Delta example. 
our, we had a number, we had six kind of like experienced pillars or tenants that we believed in. One of them, Nick's, was essentially no gotchas. And so we used um, the scrappy little tool, thousand dollars a year or so, like drop in the bucket in terms of, you know, what your you know typical spend is called Page Tiger. And we created just a series of digital eBooks that we sent to candidates to prep them for their interviews. Yep. And one, I mean, we wanted us to look better, you know, from a TA standpoint and send like forward good candidates. But we also were up against speed. And so we didn't want any gotchas for the candidate going in. We wanted them to have like a sound understanding of like, these are the types of questions that you're going to encounter. Like These are the things that this hiring team cares about. Like make sure that you're doing your homework. And then so you're not putting the candidate on their heels, but you're really able to assess them more directly. You're giving them prep time to really, you know, bring the best stories and unearth those best stories to the interview, because that's what you want to know at the end of the day is, you know, fit for this role. And if you're putting them on their heels and you have these gotchas thrown into an interview, interview, you're not giving the space. So I'm with you. And I've certainly, you know, been in that seat to prepare the candidate. Um, and, and we even, you know, even some of that rebuttal handling into those interview prep guides has been huge as well. So I I love that. I saw Paige Tiger at the um, HR Tech Expo mm -hmm. in London in April last year, and I thought it looked brilliant. And I very much doubt it was a thousand dollars a year now because their stand was amazing and the tigers they were uh -huh. handing out were so beautiful. But I mm -hmm. was not a customer, so I couldn't just go and take two for my kids. Yeah, great, great little. I mean, this was in 2018, 2019, so maybe they've up there. I would, I wouldn't be surprised, but I mean, there's tools like You're that. Suddenly awesome. getting a rush of quotes of, I hear you used to do this for Delta for a thousand bucks. Like, how do we get yeah. this? Right? <laughs> I mean, Google Slides. Everyone has Google Slides or like Teams equivalent. If you're in, a, you know, an MS like big shop, but don't let technology either be yeah. the barrier. Like. Find the concept, and there's going to be a free to freemium tool that's going to enable the success. It's more so taking the time to put your energy and resources where it matters and creating content that's actually valuable to everybody involved. Nice. Cool. Steven has asked a couple of good questions in here, yeah. Sophie. Yes. I was going to, I was, you've, you've caught me. I was going to bring him in um, to the, the chat as he's, he's put a few good questions in. So um, start with one of, he's asked a couple. Um, so uh, one being uh, the issue with recruiter enablement quite often can be, how do we know what good looks like? Um, and um, so sort of do we see that as an industry-wide problem we can solve or is it bespoke from company to company? I'm not sure if that's a follow-on or not. And then yeah, I think that I think yeah. that is. Let's 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 do that one. So yeah. I think the I think the I think the question here is, you know, how how do we with recruiter enablement? How do we know what good looks like? Mm -hmm. And do you see that as an industry wide thing or or something that should be solved from company to company? I mean, I I recall working at the company that's now have us people. And lead, I, when I left that company, I went to PwC and I spent three years there. And the first few months were honestly about, like I did a lot of work around understanding what the standards were and the standards for reporting and the standards for how I would manage a meeting and the standards for what was expected of me. It was like a bit different to have us people. And um, like Avas People was a great company, but it was not. It was a marketing agency versus like the world's number one professional services firm. So it was a, it was a completely different thing. So like Nick, you've worked with yeah. uh, mostly big businesses, but what's the like? What's your thoughts on this? I, I just what is there to gain from joining the pack mm -hmm. versus kicking the pack's backside and stepping above them? I think if you haven't got anything today, why take the step to be paritable with everyone else versus if you're already on that journey, just take one more step, leaning into it a little bit more and kick their backsides and be far, far better than them. Like, And, and is 
is being on parity with the industry going to make us stand out? And for some businesses, um, Apple, you work at Apple, you're hiring into the retail stores, you're probably not struggling with applications. If anyone here from Apple is saying otherwise, please do, and I'll change my example, but you probably don't have to sell too much. You probably don't have to go too far. It's probably far more a process administrator role that actually we have and we need to play with. But I would say probably everybody on this call may have an audience that they hire for where their business is aspirational. Yeah. But it isn't the entire business. Yeah. So, Adam, to your example, financial accountant, are they all saying, I really want to work at Apple? No, they're probably not fussed either way give it take it or leave it a mobile phone developer yeah hell yes they want to work there that's the aspirational piece so think about those audiences think about their needs and i i, I think it's important to listen and join sessions like this of what everyone else is doing but i think it's really important to go how can we do that a little bit better for our team for our audience for our managers or maybe even a little bit more relevant for their audiences as well. Nice, nice, thank you. Got a had a question come in uh, specifically for you, Nick, um, from uh, Ben Chadwick. Um, so he said, you mentioned that you have three Halion points that you want to tell that markets the company in a coherent way. The TA team will have the same story message. However, when engaging with external suppliers, how do you ensure consistency uh, that the same message is delivered and not changed to meet the supplier's narrative or the lack of knowledge of the of Haley and the brand. Yeah. Um, so hands up, Ben. We've not solved that. We've not even solved it internally mm -hmm. properly yet. So I can't tell you what we've done. I can tell you what I've done previously at Vodafone, which is have supplier days. And mm -hmm. when we set up agencies, RPOs, mm -hmm. external vendors, whatever it is, it's not just a procurement process. It's not just a, will you sign up to this payment term or that InfoSec agreement? There's an onboarding piece. And you will talk about this, you'll do this, you'll deliver this. And I've seen agencies only onboarded at the point that new internal hires are onboarded and they have a TA onboarding date. And the agency suppliers are there as well as the internal hires are there. Um, or systemized through learning and through those approach. But also, I, I've seen it checked by asking candidates, how were they prepped? What did they do? Did they find the right pieces? And there is a, a blended approach of this is us as company one, mm -hmm. but this is the company where you will be working. And you shouldn't forget your identity, but you do need to make sure that it's clear of this is us versus this is them almost. Awesome, thank you. Cool, okay. So I think we did have another question from Stephen as well. Um, so I will I will pop that in. So um, Stephen has another question, um, I think just to the room generally. Um, do you have any tips or thoughts about how to set this up effectively? I think this being um sort of all the various things he talked about um he's also gone on to say every time a new process procedure tech came into my office as a recruiter i <laughs> i scurried like a spider in the rain as far away <laughs> as I could because my mentality was yeah it may make my life easier but i would rather do 10 15 minute tasks for the next five days rather than one three hour task that will make it all easier um i i would be uh, a liar if i said I've, I've that thoughts never crossed my mind either so good question stephen thank you what do folks think so three hours forever or 102 two hours each week for the rest of your life mm -hmm. and you're right short term it is difficult yeah but also I would challenge why is anyone asking for a three hour activity to be completed? That I, I think that's unachievable. I tell you now, my attention span is not three hours. Like there's no chance I'm finishing that. So firstly, Stephen, if someone tells you three hours, 
ask how to put it into bite-sized pieces mm -hmm. and actually could you do could you do those 15 minute pieces over the next three days or the next five days as you say and then it solves it forever I think I think you've been served a, a dud option on that one if I'm honest with you so yeah I think it's bigger picture but also making it more consumable mm -hmm. and it, it's got to it's got to live longer than in the moment as well. Mm -hmm. It needs to be like recallable when you need it. If you're spending like three hours in this task, like you're in the zone for those three hours and then you're out. So I think it also goes back to that micro learning, um, you know, conversation we were having earlier of breaking it down and then making it accessible, having walk knees available if, and when you need them, when you need them. Um, versus that three hour slog. But I agree with you, you kind of, I would push, I would push back. <laughs> there's That's my there tip. About, you know, there's, there's something in there about growth mindset as well. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, a, a, a recruiter with a growth mindset is gonna, is gonna take the time to make it better. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think educating people on behaviors, which will help you in the, you know, which will help you be more effective is the right thing mm -hmm. to do. Because I've done that as well, plenty of times. I've avoided doing things, and I'll just I'll, I'll stay on a hamster wheel. Mm -hmm. I've done it. I've done it many times. I, I probably don't do it now, but I I definitely have done it a lot. Absolutely. And but what normally happens there, though, Adam is, and I've seen it. Somebody did it, and then started performing better, doing things differently. Their data moves, and then there's a oh, shoot, I need to play catch up. I need to go back and need to go do those things. So yeah. I would say you're absolutely right. All of those bits and pieces, there's probably not enough of what's in it for you. Like mm -hmm. It sounds as though it's a slog and it's painful. And three hours for me, yeah, it is painful. Like I get it. But mm -hmm. have you got the environment? Have you got the culture? Are you really clear of what is in it for you? And if you're not, fair enough to challenge it. And I think that's the other piece of recruiter enablement is you've got to challenge if it doesn't work, if it mm -hmm. can't be done. Like it's not about ivory tower mandating. This is about helping your world as a recruiter be better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've got to, you've got, you've got to have a, um, you've got to iterate, you've got to try things. And if they don't work, then uh, maybe don't fix things if they're broken, but be consistently on the lookout for ways of saving three minutes on every task. And if you can save, you know, if you can save three minutes on something, then it's worthwhile, absolutely worthwhile doing it. If something's, if something's not, if something's not broken, that doesn't mean that there isn't a better way. Mm -hmm. And if something's broken, there is a better way. There has to be a better way. Yeah. I mean, this is the definition of broken, right? So. And some companies accept broken. Some companies are cool with that. And again, that's your culture, that's your environment. Then you need to enable your recruiters to understand that's how we do it and we're all cool with it. Mm -hmm. But either way, we've looked at this the whole way through of leveling up and going up a gear. But actually, and I'm not saying any of the businesses on this call or anyone that's left any comments are happy with mediocre. But if that is your business operating model and that is how you do it, I think it's important to set expectations because people are going to upset things. They're going to not fit in. They're going to jar with the business. Yeah. So it's just about bringing them in. But I think one of the bits that we've spoken about a lot, and obviously recruiter enablement is a big, big piece, but I think everybody seems to stop at like training and done. Mm -hmm. It's about adoption. It's about making this a way of life. Like giving you a three hour training course is great. Are you going to do it in three months time? No, you're not because you just remember the three hours of your life you gave up for something versus where are you at in a month's time? What's happening here? Now you need to train others. That changes it and it makes it an adoption piece, not just enablement. Mm -hmm. I think there's something about... Um... I'm interested to know your thoughts on, I'm a believer in spoon feeding people. Um, I think that training is important, but actually just putting things into their hand and making them accessible the minute they need them mm -hmm. is also something that's, that's quite important because 
I mean, we're all on Slack or Teams or whatever, and in recruitment teams where every single day you've got, hey, does anybody know where I can find mm -hmm. whatever it is, this piece of knowledge or this piece of content or this policy or whatever it is? And, and making things really accessible to mm -hmm. people can sometimes be more effective than a one-off training intervention. Yeah, 100%. The, the one-off events or the, the, the kind of sheep dip training is, is yeah. I always look at it as to bring everybody up to a level of, mm -hmm. a, a power level of knowledge. It doesn't solve everything. And actually what you find is it's probably 20% of the journey, maybe 30% of the journey that you want to take. But it opens their eyes to a better way of doing things, a different way of doing it. They can feel and see some experiences. And then, as you said, iterate, Adam, you've got to keep going. And now the next bit is this, and the next bit is this. You delivered your, this is it, this is how we want you to be, do everything this way. The barrier to entry is way too high, and people are going to go, it's too much. I'm freaked out by it. Because mm -hmm. if they just did a 30-minute session, a 60-minute session, but then in three months' time, they had a five-minute session or whatever it is. They'll get there. They'll adopt it. They'll buy into it. But also, it's just done over a slower period. Uh, Mila had another question. Yeah. Um, it, it's quite a specific one. Um, uh -huh. Did I miss that? I'm not sure. I'm I'm, uh, I'm not yeah. sure it's recruiter enablement. I think all if, if you consider all technology to be recruiter enablement, it is. But yeah, one way one way video interviewing. Any thoughts on that? Uh, there is a role of a TV talk show host for a reason, and when you've got Brad Pitt, who is a trained actor and knows how to play up to camera, still being interviewed by the likes of James Corden probably says there's a reason for that so i am not anti it i think it serves a purpose for me i think it's a knockout step mm -hmm. Agree. but I, I i i think actually depending on the role you're hiring and the business that you're working for you can't find enough about an individual without some absolutely amazing questions in there for it to work but I, i've used it i've hired a cfo at a previous company we didn't even review the answers all we wanted was to give them something they'd never done before and of five people that all came from search firms three of them point blank refused because it was beneath them and not how they were going to do it two of them did it and said this is brilliant i loved it i think i did rubbish but i did something different we hired one of those two people they later went on to turn around that business from a financial perspective in a pretty big way. So mm -hmm. it depends what you're trying to get from it. Yeah. Mila, I've, I'm with Nick. I think it needs to be early on in the process if you're going to use it either at like a screen or a knockout. I think it has a place in time if you're dealing with volume and you need to scale your process pretty quickly. I worked at an organization where we would get 20,000 applicants you know, for a single role that was highly customer service facing. Um, and so it was relevant to that experience in that process. I think for me, um, I want to see the option to re-record a few times, you know, you know, maybe a hundred times is a little excessive, but I'm going to give you like three to five shots. It's, it's an unfamiliar technology. It's incredibly awkward. You're going to fumble your first couple of times through. So again, I think this goes back to, you know, that enablement of the candidate. I don't want to stand in their way from putting their best foot forward. And so if I'm using this in a process, I want to market that experience in a really engaging way where they're set up for success and they feel comfortable. And so place and time, um, I'm a fan for, for, for certain roles, um, but not not every role. Okay, Nick. Final final comments. Um, things that you think people need. What, what's like so, some of the things that you think people need to know about this subject that we maybe haven't covered? Um, start bloody doing it. Like <laughs> it's not that big a problem. Like remove this scare approach that you have in your head of like 
we can't do it. It's this mountain that we need a specialist team or individuals or a uh, dedicated resource for. It's not. You're doing it already. Everyone is already doing this. You're now just doing it joined up as a team sport, which I think everyone still agrees hiring is still a team sport, unless I missed the memo that it isn't. Um, to just join it up, start doing it. Start with the what are the what are the three or five things or ten things that every candidate says to us that they decline us for? Like just ask, and knowledge really will be power for people to start solving it. And I guarantee, or I at least hope and guarantee, that every single one of you, when you have a candidate say, "I don't want to work at you," I'm not interested because, or I'm not interested, that at least you ask, "What is it that makes you not interested?" And then you probably go and give an answer anyway. If you've had an absolutely killer answer that gets everyone going, oh, yes, I'd love to then, just share it with the rest of your team. Just put it on LinkedIn post if you've got to put it somewhere and you've got no other team. Like, share it and also consume it and try new things. So I, there's millions, million more things we could talk about here, Adam, but I think just bloody start. It's the first thing I would say. Like, you're absolutely <laughs> right. Just start somewhere <clears throat> nice <laughs> do we want to take this la let's just take this last question then from Stephen, yeah. which is um um so how, how 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 do you track what's working and what's not uh <clears throat> so so much of this is uh, it's down to your data so things like email response rate things like candidate closing things like candidate dropout rates We've all got data available to us, but also there's the anecdotal piece of if someone just looks cool as a cucumber in the corner of the office, smashing out 50 hires a month, and you're sat there, you've lost all your hair, you're going nuts, like, look at them. That it doesn't mind not showing the numbers, but something's working. Like, it is not just about performance. I really strongly believe that there's a lot about enjoyment of what we do as well and i think sometimes we just need a bit of a reality check of actually we just got 50 people 500 people at their new job which will provide for their families and their individuals and give them self-value i think sometimes we forget that and we just go it's just it's just rec rec one just needs to be filled like by somebody whose main source of income is going to come from what you're doing so yeah, I think measure it through feeling, measure it through NPS surveys from your candidate, measure it through your performance data, ask your managers, however you want to do it. I don't I don't want to prescribe these are the top five things. If you just do one of them and start doing it and do it consistently, you're winning. That's it. That's all you got to do is just start. Nick, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really learned uh, a lot, and uh, it's been uh, terrific to hear to hear from you. Um, we are going to be doing our second um, of these sessions. It's not a month from now. We've got to, like May first, oh, getting started. Yeah, three weeks yes. First of May, same time, same place. We have Amy Cropper joining us. She is head of talent acquisition at Tricentis. Previously, she led recruiter enablement at Amazon uh, and at Accenture. So she's been in this space for quite some time and we'll have a lot of things to talk about. But um, Nick, thanks for being our um, guinea pig. This is officially the worst one of these that we've ever oh, done. Thanks, Adam. I'm going to wear that with a badge of honor. Like That's a badge of honor for me. Yeah. I need some more enablement on these things then, clearly. <laughs> that's what it is. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye, all.